Well, hello everyone and welcome to Commsverse session 219, centralized control over voice for internationally distributed teams deployments and the layering of additional services. Uh, this is brought to you by Trevor Davies and um, after the session, there will be a breakout session. I will post the link for that uh, towards the end of Trevor's presentation. Um, please feel free to ask any questions through the Q&A facility that is available to you as attendees. And now live over to Trevor. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, you'll notice the title in this uh, commsverse uh, headliner slide is additional services. That's because my title was so long, I couldn't fit it all on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, when I when I uh, submitted the title, they said, oh, gosh, Trev, that's a, it's a bit on the long side, isn't it? And uh, they suggested an abbreviated version. I never got around to putting the abbreviated one in. Um, so this is my, if I can get it to move, uh, is my title, Layering of Additional Services on Top of Microsoft Teams and Centralized Control over Voice for internationally distributed teams of deployments. It is a mouthful, but actually it does tell you what I'm going to talk about. And really what I'm going to talk about is my experience in uh, with Teams rollouts and the different kinds of services that I've seen people uh, introduce. And we'll take it, take it as it comes through the presentation. So I'm actually speaking on behalf of some pals of mine from Fuse2 who are uh, sponsors of the event and have a booth and they are very much worth going to have a chat with because they were one of the early adopters in terms of rolling out direct routing for teams in the UK. I think maybe there was only one or two players in the game when Fuse 2 started and so they really know their stuff and I'm going to use some one or two case studies of theirs as I go through the talk because I think uh, pictures speak louder than words really. Just a little bit about me, uh, who am I? Uh, I've been in, a, in the VoIP game for a long time. I was one of the founding board members of the SIT Forum, uh, if you're familiar with it. It's the Global Trade Association of the VoIP industry. When it started in 1999, it's really right, only two or three years after the whole concept of VoIP was, was invented. I was the co-founder and CTO of a service provider called Tomiko for 10 years. Tomiko is still around and uh, thriving. Um, I was... I'm on the board and was a founder member of the UK ITSP Association, Internet Telephony Service Providers Association, in 2004. So that's been going for 16 years and it just shows you what level of maturity this whole industry's got to. People don't talk about anything other than VoIP these days, do they? I'm currently managing director of a company called NetAxis in the UK. We are a systems integrator and a software development house, and we have a lot of big telcos. We have uh, BT, Vodafone, Orange, Proximus, KPN, a lot, a lot of people around the world actually, who we provide services for. And I'm also chairman of a London-based members not-for-profit organisation, which is a peering exchange, and that has most of the large content providers in that, and the uh, eyeball networks uh, as uh, members of that. And you can read the rest of me, CV. It's a formerly director of ISPA, um, member of the ICO Technology Reference Panel, and so on. And uh, I, mean, I can't see what you can see in me, but... This is what I looked like before the lockdown, and this is what I look like now. And I can tell you, my wife is uh, really looking forward to the day where I have a haircut, and she has never had a beard or a moustache in her life. And I just figured, uh, if I was going to do it, now is the time. <laughs> there we go. The so as we talk about uh, direct routing specifically in Teams and Voice, there are, there are a few building blocks that that I always come into play. One of them is obviously Teams, and uh, one of them is a session border controller. It has to be a certified, Microsoft certified session border controller. Uh, we have handsets, certified or otherwise. Uh, we have uh, applications, servers, and PBXs, which can provide overlay services. Um, uh, when you think about it, uh, PBX typically might have three or 400 fun features now. And we have something which you may or may not have heard of, which are session routing engines. And I'll talk in some length that how session routing engines can be used to stick additional services and features and functionalities to your team's direct routing setup. If we look at direct routing in its, at its simplest base, what is it all about? 
then uh, first of all, direct routing is basically a SIP trunk from the Teams world to the outside world, and you have to have a certified session border controller to do it. The, there are three main vendors, the audio codes, Ribbon and Oracle. I'm not favoring any of them here, although I have used one or two uh, diagrams from some of them uh, to help me with my uh, presentation. And basically, direct routing is simple inbound and outbound voice. It's uh, a replacement to the Microsoft calling plan. And the whole purpose of it was that Microsoft found that they, they'd reached 12 or 13 markets for the calling plan. And the difficulties associated with extending that to elsewhere in the world, uh, was such that there's more hassle than it's worth. And uh, there are companies such as telcos who do this kind of thing for a living. And so by creating direct routing, they brought the ability for telco partners to come in, carry on offering their own services to their own customers, as well as those customers wanting to use Microsoft, but also being able to add pops for inbound and outbound numbering uh, and calling around the world in areas not supported by Microsoft. So, you know, if you live in Albania, for example, you can now get an Albanian number uh, by partnering, by taking services from the appropriate service provider, whereas you might not have been able to do that using Microsoft. Um, if we look at how a session border controller fits into the world, so this is a session border controller pre-Microsoft direct routing, and it's effectively, it's a gateway to the outside world and a means for uh, a business to provide access to a SIP trunk, uh, to a, a, a SIP service provider, like Fuse 2, for example. Uh, it connects to the PSTN and it will hook up the various devices in that environment, hook up the PBX, hook up analog phones, analog faxes, IP phones, um, as a, a basic routing capability that allows uh, people in an enterprise, say, to route to the outside world instead of using an ISDN. And uh, the kind of functionality it provides a security, it's a demarcation line. It, it can do transcoding, so between different codecs that come in, somebody coming in with a 729 call, it can translate to 711 uh, so that both sides understand what they're talking about. So that is the basic session border controller environment. Adding Teams then and the connection to the Teams world is quite straightforward. It's really just another SIP trunk. Uh, that's it's it's very simple in its uh, its most basic element. And of course, what the by having this environment around Teams allows people to ov already overlay different services. So if I just I've stuck a few down here. So you connect to a PBX and the PBX brings with it typically, like I said, over the years, competitively, these boxes have had to develop more and more features to try and out, out feature set its competitors, but they've all ended up with roughly the same feature sets now. Uh, you know, you're looking at, talking at IVR, conferencing. I mean, I know Teams is a conferencing environment in its own right, but it relies on an internet connection. So you can provide dial-in capabilities to Teams. Uh, you can have time of day routing policies, Basic fixed mobile convergence, so inbound calls to a, a geographic number, fixed number, could route to Teams or to a mobile, obviously over the top. And other added value features like voicemail to text, email, speech recognition, anything really you, that you can think of that you can normally get in a kind of PBX environment. And um, so we, that was, it started off life really as a, an in-premises kind of thing, but really now most of the implementations I see are cloud-based. So the the SBC is not actually at a, at a customer's premises. Uh, here, you know, I've shown you an SBC running on effectively running on a VM in a cloud. Uh, it could be the service provider's own cloud. It could be AWS. Could be Azure. And in fact, it's an obvious thing, isn't it? Uh, in the Teams world to have it um, sitting in Azure. And that seems to be as often as not, that is what happens with service providers. The, there's an obvious evolution and extension here as well. And that takes us to where it's a single SPC isn't good enough. Voice is really very much mission critical uh, service. So in fact, 
when I was uh, the CTO of Tomiko, we were a full service communications provider. We had MPLS network, we had broadband, we had uh, cloud services, we had voice, VoIP, mobile. It was only when the voice went down that the phone started ringing big time. And so voice really is mission critical. So it's a, a natural evolution to move from having a single SPC to having high availability pair. And as you do that, you're growing up the number, the size of your uh, session board if you're in Troller Estate. You uh, get into the realms of either being able to talk to companies which have multiple sites or having a multi-tenant service where you can offer uh, the same service to lots of different companies using the same uh, pop, the same pair of SPCs. And typically these SPCs are very scalable. And so when we, we don't really talk very often about having more than a pair in one spot because the pair can scale up from 50 sessions to 50,000 sessions or more easily. Ah, you just need to grow the underlying virtual machine that goes with it. Now, so we, we started off with a PBX and an SBC on premises, and now we've moved the SBC into the cloud. And actually, uh, we live in a real hybrid world, so the SBC is in the cloud and the, S and the PBX is in the premises here. But actually, there's nothing to stop us moving that PBX also into the cloud. Uh, the slight difference, if I go back, then we see that we all we need an edge device usually as often as not. Be it, maybe you see just even a firewall, but sometimes a gateway. If you have an analog uh, device, a state that you need to connect. Uh, so you would do that locally, and some also some uh, disaster recovery failover kind of functionality sometimes. But uh, we move the PBX into the cloud. It becomes an application server again. It's not a, a piece of hardware anymore. Um, and that opens the door again to multi-tenant services or serving the same enterprise across multiple sites. So you can see actually there's quite a nice evolution here. And in fact, these sites do not all have to be serviced by the same PBX. Uh, you may have, uh, a, if you have a, a company with 15 or 20 sites, some of them may all have a load of different PBXs and you're not going to just throw all that kit away in one go. You're going to have an evolutionary approach thereby as they come on end of life or uh, as it makes sense and you want to grow the functionality uh, pro provided to a specific site, you would, you'd get rid of them and replace them with teams and hosted services as made sense. Now, quick swig. Um, one of the, so this is a case study. Just clean my specs. The Institute of Development Studies actually is a world leading, it's the world leader in development studies in the world. <laughs> I actually had never heard of uh, the, 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 what's the word, the discipline of development studies, but having looked into it now, there's a lot of it goes on. And these guys have got 300 members of staff who uh, travel all around the world to emerging uh, nations and do studies that help them decide on how to grow, help them with economics, all sorts of stuff. Uh, now, they've got 300 members of staff. Only 10% or even less, 5 or 10% are in the office at the same time. But they have a short tail PBX, which is now coming to the end of its life. It served its purpose, but no longer really fit for purpose for the modern world that uh, the IDS lives in. And so the IDS looked around and decided that Teams was the way to go. And they came across Fuse2, who were, like I said, quite early on adopters in this game. And they sat down with Fuse2 and came up with a plan because it didn't really, it didn't make sense to go with a big bang approach where they say, right, let's just get rid of the PBX. We'll stick everybody with Teams voice and let's start off with a proof of concept. And they started off with a small team uh, just testing. Uh, the functionality of Teams, direct routing with hand headsets and with a connection to the rest of the company using the se um, session border controller and talking to the short tail PBX. So it went really well, fair play. And this was extended department by department to the point where they said, well, hang on. This is working really well. Let's just roll it out to everybody. And, and they wrote one weekend, they rolled out 
uh, Microsoft Teams to all the staff that needed it. And they were still left with the Shortel PBX, which actually, for the moment, was still in uh, under a maintenance contract. The maintenance contract was expensive and was they were maintaining stuff that they didn't really use anymore. So they were going to get rid of it. Uh, but while it was still under contract, they kept it because uh, it saved them having to replace some of the handsets in, in places that in the buildings they were not very often used. So in corridors, I guess people have handsets in corridors sometimes and in reception maybe. Uh, and rather than buy Teams licenses for these handsets, they said, right, let's just keep those old phones. And we kept, we kept the Shortel going, talking to the Teams estate through the session border controller. And the idea was that once that support ends, then Fuse2 have put a, a gateway, a SIP gateway based on asterisk into the Azure cloud. And they will be able to replace those expensive um, proprietary Shortel handsets with low cost 30 quid Yaelink handsets or whoever they want to get them from, uh, instead of having to invest uh, in slightly more expensive and some of these uh, the Teams handsets I've seen go up to 180 pounds. And so this is roughly what the that whole world looks like now. They're using a ribbon hosted uh, session border controller in their own cloud. The, the, the get asterisk server, the gateway actually is in sat, sat, sat in the Azure cloud. And the, we have one really happy customer there who are very happy to be uh, quoted as a, a case study. And I think it's a perfect, it's an ideal kind of case study for the team's environment. Right? Now, quick swig. So I mentioned right at the beginning, the session routing engine beyond the SPC. Uh, what is <coughs> a session routing engine? Well, Telecom networks have had routing engines for a long, for, forever. Okay. Uh, I guess the early ones uh, were, uh, were the receptionist, a switchboard operator with a, a plug-in thing in a, in a board that she'd plug things into. Um, but nowadays, uh, they, these routing engines have to cope with hundreds of thousands of calls and they are big beasts sat in telecoms networks. The only thing is, these uh, routing engines have been around since T0 really and they're fine for just routing high volumes of calls and not having to do anything other than route for stuff from A to B but really these days in the especially when we bring domains like the world of teams into it and all these other uh, online features and functionalities that come with the modern world that routing engines have adapted and evolved and you now have an, a beast called the session routing engine which is uh, api driven uh, allows you to hook up to external uh, databases and sources of information uh, so that drives intelligent routing they have sit proxy and redirect modes they have uh, intelligent uh, sexy drag and drop gui so you can build routes uh, on a gui just by dragging on a block network elements and i've shown you an example here the font's too small for me to actually read what it says but uh the the experience of people using this kind of functionality in session routing engines has revolutionized the operational side of running networks for example i'm quoted one customer of ours who said historically if a customer there's raised a ticket wanting to change something on the session border controller, they'd raise a ticket, an engineer would have to go in, make the changes and do it right. And even using a routing engine, it would be a 10 minute process per change. Uh, because of the user interface here, that 10 minutes is reduced to one or two minutes. And you can just imagine uh, across a, an estate an, on a telecoms operator who have thousands and thousands of customers, that ends up as a massive saving in operational costs. The other um, area of improvement uh, where the API functionality uh, comes into play is, for example, being able to integrate uh, your systems into a customer's uh, into a self care portal for customers. So instead of uh, you going in and making a change, uh, the customer can do it. Uh, it might be just be as simple as call forwarding, or if it when a disaster has happened and they have to reroute to different sites then the customers themselves can go and do it. Um, 
and, and basic things like d dynamic CLIs, where, where people have a DDI in Microsoft Teams, and, and instead when they do an outbound calling, want to display the main uh, switchboard number. So that's a very easy thing to do when you have a session routing engine. And, and some of these uh, features are perfectly doable with uh, session border controllers, but they are really complicated to implement quite often. And, you know, it's uh, the f ease of making it happen with an SRE is just, you know, a world's apart, really. Some of the other features, uh, for example, with a session border controller, at the end of the day, they are quite simple devices. They they route from A to B. And with, a, with the routing engine, you can add call bundles to individual lines, even, or to individual trunks. Where, whereas with a session border controller, you can only do it with generic destination trunks. You can access external databases. And I, I'm going to talk a bit about that towards the end of the talk. But the other uh, feature of using a, a session routing engine is that because you can embed it in your network, then you start being able to offer true uh, fixed mobile convergence and mobility. So rather than just rerouting uh, phones out to a mobile network, you can do it in, in, inherently in your own network. I mean, you'd have to have a mobile network to, to be able to do it, but uh, and it's a far more elegant. It's the it's, it's a way of providing true fixed mobile convergence. Uh, and, and so as a further kind of feature, if you're providing a facility to, for intercompany calls between teams and non-teams users, usually you have to trombone that call out across the service provider network and back. And if you have an, a session routing engine in place, you'll be able to route that call locally. So, I mean, there are a whole list of, I've got more written down on my own, but, but uh, there's a whole list of benefits. And in fact, as you as you investigate uh, the, the benefits specifically for a service provider, then with the session routing engine, you can usually define your data model exactly as you need it. I'll show you examples in a minute now. Uh, you can, uh, you, you don't have to try and squeeze uh, functionality and features into using the existing database that's fixed on a session border controller. You can also easily provision millions of end user numbers. There's no limit, actually, whereas most uh, session border controllers do have a limit. And th things like uh, call admission control on any any parameter going, uh, and I'll show you the list now, uh, call forwarding based on the end user number, uh, use of APIs to the external system. So, for example, you could prioritize uh, a certain number of calls certain number of channels from the main line number or prioritize a certain number of channels into sales. Because obviously you want to get the sales going uh, over and above to individual user extensions, for example. And you could do that using a session routing engine. And things like, uh, so things that help operations such as the batch provisioning, it all happens via API. And there's a whole bundle of other things. Uh, now, so just as a, uh, an example of the types of uh, database table entries. I've listed a few here. And, you know, if you, if we're coming back to thinking to my access control or the call routing based on uh, different parameters in here, could be uh, that uh, you've got a user address in here or a site address. And when you make it routing a call, then the it's making use of the actual address. If you If, you, if you're dialing in emergency services, for example, and as long as the data is maintained, then it's able to present the emergency services with the, the address of the number being called from or the calling party. And if I look at a real world example, this is a, a Fuse 2 example. Uh, my main case study uh, subject today. So Fuse 2, customers can go onto their portal, which is called Edge. Uh, either customers or resellers, and they can they can buy numbers or assign numbers to themselves. The UK geographic, uh, NGNs, non-geographics, or, or international numbers. And the the few whose portal take this in and assign the numbers to the relevant service that the customer signed up for: Teams, Direct Routing, Zip Trunk, or a hosted VoIP service, maybe. And the API into the SRE lets the Fuse Two system route the number of the calls from that number based on what makes sense. So, for example, they've got a customer with an office in Singapore. 
the Singapore calls from the Singapore number are routed out locally because if you don't and you enter into uh, maybe a two or three hundred millisecond lag as the call has to go back to the UK to the session border controller and back out and it could be uh, it's routed on based on these cost routing um, there's a, the whole you know there's a whole gamut of different uh, ways that you'd want to route calls there. So that's a, an example of how you'd use a uh, session router engine API full of actions here for uh, routing based on numbering. Now, just a couple of slides left. The, I won't do over time. I'm all right, plenty of time. It's about a 30 minute talk. This. Uh, so we started off with single uh premise with an with a, a session border controller on premise we saw how that moved to the cloud and then we saw it moving changing from one session border to a couple of high availability session border controllers with uh application servers uh, uh offering hosted pbx tele telephony services and how that moved to becoming multi-tenant and supporting multiple sites well, here we have the scenario where everyone attending the commsverse uh, conference has got an account somewhere a teams account and we have a conference going on in singapore one going on in london and one going on in new york i think correct me if i'm wrong somewhere then way out west anyway and so you'd have the same instance of the session border controller pair you'd have the uh, application server, your Broadworks or Ring Central, or whatever your Broadworks specifically, I guess. You'd have the local call processor from the routing engine, all in the local clouds. And I, I mean, yes, Azure will have local clouds in the relevant spaces all around the world. And you'd also have a single, uh, it could be HA pair, centralized element manager, where you're actually. This is where you're programming your routing. And you do not have to manage and update your routing on each of the individual session border controllers or even each of the individual call processes. It's just done centrally out of one spot. So it's just one pane of glass that you control your whole global estate. And if we go to the ultimate uh, instantiation, if that's the right word, then we got this is what the customer case study in the Netherlands it's the largest insurance company in the Netherlands and they have this setup they have an SRE with a centralized element manager but they control everything from Active Directory so all the all the different services that they give their staff are all managed from the provision the profiles in the Active Directory and the Active the, all they have to do is change their active directory based on levers new starters and whatever and that feeds automatically into the sre uh, which feeds automatically across the patch and that's how that's a global uh, rollout of a, a service uh, you can envisage loads of other different types of um, integrations there through the api things like enum for example spring to mind but yeah so we've gone from single uh direct routing one premise spc to a complex uh, estate right across the world with lots and lots of different services being overlaid and um, i think that's me you can uh so well, i've already done that first bullet point really am i but uh by all means rock up at fuse 2's virtual booth if you want to talk to them. a really great bunch of lads i've got a breakout meeting which uh be really exciting to meet somebody because I can't see you here, yeah, come on. Uh, or email me at trev at netaxis.solutions if you want to understand a bit more about if you're physically looking at uh, providing uh, direct routing services yourselves, then I'm, uh, I'm around and you can get hold of me and that's what I'm here for. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Trevor. Um, so there are no questions at the moment. Um, I'm wondering whether any of the 18 attendees here would ha do have any questions. Um, 
clearly we don't want to close it off and, and prevent those from being asked. But um, equally, it's quite interesting uh, uh, that when you know you only have to roll the clock back a year or two, and there were only one or two service providers offering uh, direct routing services, and. I organised, as I'm on the, I mentioned at the start, I'm on the board of the ITSP Association. I, I'd, I'd been to a, a Microsoft workshop in Copenhagen and I was blown away actually with the, there were standing room only and there were uh, service providers from around Europe had come to talk about, to see what, what the whole thing was about. And I was chatting to some of them in the coffee break and they were saying, really, Microsoft is both a threat and an opportunity because a lot of these big service providers are already offering similar conferencing services and uh, collaboration services to what Microsoft were proposing. Right? But they felt that they needed to be in the room because if they, you know, they, well, they were risking not losing customers completely. And so I took that back to the UK and I organized this workshop for the ITSP community, the Internet Telephony, Telephony Service Provider community in the UK. And I initially I came across some hostility actually because they these guys felt threatened, some of them, especially if their whole business was built around offering hosted voice services rather than just wholesale kind of propositions. Uh, but when we actually had the workshop, we had 80 or 90 people rock up for the workshop. It was standing room only, it was packed and it just shows that there was a lot of interest. And since then, and especially since lockdown, the, if you're offering direct routing for teams, you're booming. I've seen people come in with three and a half thousand simultaneous voice sessions for large utility companies. And this is not uh, where oh, we want a maximum of three and a half thousand sessions. We want to constantly use three and a half thousand sessions. You know that is a huge that that is effectively 35 50 thousand people using teams with direct routing for voice right so it has uh it's really coming into its own and i'm quite excited by it all right okay so there we go got no questions um so i guess people can join you in the breakout session i've posted the link into the I'll go uh, there announcements as well yeah see see who's there yeah. um give people a chance to uh, to just um make contact and network with you and okay. um thanks very much trevor and uh, thank you all for attending and uh, enjoy the rest of Com comsverse see you later see you bye bye, -bye.